As Executive Director of the Instituto Cervantes in New York, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you tonight to this uh, very, very special event. We feel truly honored to host this public discussion about the opportunities and challenges of the Pacific Alliance for the Latin American region with high representatives of four Latin American countries. Uh, Luis Carlos Villegas, Ambassador of Colombia, Harold Forsyth, Ambassador of Peru, Ambassador Sandra Fuentes, Consul General of uh, Mexico in New York, and Mauricio Hurtado, Deputy Chief of Mission of Chile. Uh, I would like to extend uh, our special gratitude to Harold Forsyth for his enthusiastic support in organizing this event. And uh, also to the American Society and Council of the Americas who has been uh, co sponsoring this uh, uh, event. And uh, Randy Melsey, she's, going, she's coming from American Society and she's going to uh, moderate the discussion. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the Consul General of Spain, Juan Ramón Martínez Salazar, who is going to officially open this event. Thank you. Good evening. It's my very pleasure to welcome you to this round table today on the Pacific Alliance Cervantes Institute, which is our house and is also your house. The goal of the Alliance, as we'll hear later, is to create a free trade corridor of all countries in the Americas with the Pacific Coast. The hope is that <laughs> dropping all barriers to labor, finance and trade will help the Alliance become a hub for commerce with Asia. Spain has observer status in the Alliance. In fact, we are among the first countries to apply. We are very, very much eager to hear the presentation today and the debate by the four ambassadors present here. And let me hope there will be a lot of questions tonight. So, enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. we're going to run the program is that each ambassador will give a presentation of about seven minutes and then I will open the floor for questions and you have to prepare some very good thought-provoking questions because <laughs> not if not you're going to force me to do it and I've got some prepared but I prefer for you to ask so the ambassadors will speak in alphabetical order of their countries so first we have Minister Mauricio Hurtado of Chile Thank you very much indeed for coming uh, this evening. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I would like to thank, especially the Cervantes Institute, for organizing this event that is allowing us to uh, take the Pacific Alliance beyond the Beltway. So far, we have been very active in promoting uh, the alliance in Washington D.C., the capital. But we need to go beyond to go to other states. I think this is going to be one of the first uh, road shows, if I can call you that way, to, uh, to do it during this year. Uh, I am the DCM of the Embassy of Chile in Washington, D.C., and I'm here on behalf of my ambassador that just presented the credentials uh, yesterday to President Obama, and that is why he couldn't be here, but I'm completely sure that he will uh, uh, go to the other uh, events that we're going to promote in the future uh, in the rest of uh, the, the United States. <laughs> uh, my, my presentation is going to be mainly in the protocol that we signed uh, last February. You know, the four members of the Pacific Alliance signed an agreement to eliminate 92% of the trade tariffs among them. The remaining 8% will be eliminated in periods of three and seven years. We expect this protocol will come into effect in 2015 after the ratification in the respective Congress. Uh, this uh, protocol is a milestone. I think it's the most important agreement that we have signed after the framework agreement in 2012. Uh, and it's uh, very important in the Pacific Alliance evolution and is reiterating uh, the high level of commitment of the four members of the Alliance in order to promote free movement of goods, services, capital, and people. 
this protocol supplements, harmonizes, improves, and updates the bilateral free trade agreements that the four countries had with each other. We hope that it will enhance the intra block trade, which is so far very limited, only 4% of what we trade with the world, very far, for example, with the 28 and 29 percent of the ASEAN countries. Uh, we expect that this, with this protocol our uh, trade figures among ourselves will reach uh, double figures in the years to come. Uh, more important, I think the protocol will stimulate our private sector to work in association with, uh, within the alliance to develop a more integrated supply chain in order to achieve higher levels of competitiveness in third markets, especially in uh, uh, the Asia-Pacific region. The agreement on rules of origins, for example, uh, gives an enormous possibility to accumulate the supply chains uh, and it's going to be very functional in this uh, purpose of working together among the different private sec sectors within the, in the alliance. This is something unprecedented in the Latin American integration, which uh, perhaps most of you know that haven't been very successful in promote, promoting this joint spirit of uh, uh, entrepreneurial among the, uh, the private sectors. Uh, it would be unrealistic, of course, to expect uh, to attain at this level a degree of complementarity that uh, have reached the Asian economies, uh, at least in the short term. Uh, especially considering that we still face some challenges, big challenges in the area of infrastructure, in the area of logistics, but uh, mainly because the production structures in the uh, countries of the Pacific Alliance is based on unsophisticated uh, raw materials and uh, manufacturers that are uh, in principle low in complementarity. So we have there a huge challenge to address and the challenge is mainly for the public sector to create synergies between uh, uh, different entrepreneurs, the public sectors and uh, uh, different companies in our region to identify pot potential production chains, uh, to define policies and strategies uh, for every, and, uh, every sector. If we follow the, we take into consideration uh, the ASEAN integration model, there are another big challenge that we need to address, mainly in the area of human capital development. Uh, to be able to participate in the global supply chains, we need more than, than trade liberalization, uh, more than uh, tariff reductions. It will require, require productivity, it will require innovation. <coughs> It involves making a very strong investment in education, in training our people. That is, per is the purpose of the educational reform that the administration of President Bachelet will carry on in the next year, which is especially geared toward investing in human capital to increase our productivity. We realize that knowledge is essential Knowledge is very good for everybody, but for development is fundamental, especially when, when we are talking about uh, developing countries. The Pacific Alliance uh, has received a lot of international attention in the last two years because it represents a new way of pragmatic integration that is offering plenty of opportunities to its members and to those who associate with them. Opportunities which come from the very essence of this economic space. More than 200 million inhabitants, freedom of movement, very young human resources, growth over 5% in average, common <coughs> language and culture, potential for infrastructure projects that amount for more than $56 billion and plenty of natural resources. 
this protocol and what is represent that is tariff uh, elimination and uh, uh, trade facilitations, emergence of regional value chains, etc., is another very important building block leading to 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 get this deep economic integration that is the main goal, the main aim of the four members of the alliance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Rufalo. Sorry. And now we have Ambassador Villegas from Colombia. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased, it's a privilege and an honor to be here uh, at the Cervantes Institute. I have to confess that I don't feel very comfortable speaking English in the Cervantes Institute. Uh, but when I think about it, you do this nowadays because you have to speak to the majority. In 15 years, it will be in Spanish. <laughs> um, let me uh, take from my minutes uh, half of it to link what is happening in Colombia and the Pacific Alliance. We have suffered, I think, the most dramatic change, positive change, in the developing world in the last uh, decade, a decade and a half. We came back from the brink, as a paper published in this city read a few years ago. Uh, we have a new Colombia in front of us, a new Colombia that uh, is dynamic, is growing at 5%, that has moved uh, poverty from 60% to half of it, 30% last year, and moving down fast to 20% by the end of this decade, that has uh, opened its economy to the world forces and markets. We tripled our foreign trade. We multi multiplied by eight by day eight times our foreign direct investment, uh, and we have relations of free trade with almost two billion consumers uh, in the world. Uh, the macroeconomics of Colombia are in very good shape: low inflation, big growth, as I told you, uh, investment grade, uh, and it has produced a change of uh, uh, or. Uh, middle class that is really dramatic. That's one of the advantages of the Pacific, Pacific Alliance is that <coughs> it's, a, uh, it's a group of countries with a very strong and dynamic uh, middle class. So uh, what is left for Colombia to become a developed country in 25 years? We have to end our conflict and that's the last homework we are dealing with. As you most of you probably know, we reached a third agreement with FARC last Friday on one of the most difficult issues of the agenda, that's illicit drugs. And it brings new optimism that uh, we will reach an agreement uh, to end that uh, uh, internal conflict that has been around for 50 years. In that scenario of, of new peace, negotiated, politically negotiated peace, we can see an even better color in all aspects of politics, social field, and economics. So this alliance of the Pacific makes part of that new Colombia, of that new reality, a new way of integrating Colombia with, uh, the, with the rest of the world. We are like-minded countries, or as the ambassador of Mexico baptized this effort some uh, months ago, uh, that uh, brings to the world uh, a 2.5 trillion GDP market with uh, 250 billion million uh, consumers and uh, uh, a coordinated uh, economic policy, central banks that will meet frequently, uh, ministers of finance that will be talking uh, also very frequently, uh, regula regulatory measures, uh, supervising uh, so the financial sector also in coordination, uh, energy, uh, and also in the center of the integration idea, the presence of the four countries have both people. People because we think in the Pacific Alliance that that's the center of the integration. Integration is not only, only a question of figures or trade or investment, but people that can move freely, that can invent, that can innovate, that can create enterprises, that can move from ideas to projects with the help and support 
of our society. And that's why the free flow of trade has been accompanied, as the minister said, uh, by the free flow of uh, persons and the free flow of uh, capitals and goods and services. So the, the horizon of this Pacific Alliance is, uh, is bright. Uh, we will be, I think, uh, with all our legal uh, procedures accomplished by the end of this year, Colombia is in the middle of the ratification process. We had to repeat the process uh, of uh, uh, treatment, of legal treatment in Congress because of an order of the Constitutional Court that was issued a few weeks ago. So we'll have a ratification process by mid of next semester. And with that, uh, I think the ratification process of the four will be completed and then on legal issues will be um, dealt with. Um, we have uh, some novelties in the, in the integration effort of the Alliance of the Pacific. The first is that we have a common fund for infrastructure. That's something that Latin America has tried to build for many years without success. Uh, we are, since the beginning of the 20th century, we talked about railroads that went from Mexico to Buenos Aires or new canals that would cross Central America, or uh, roads that would cross uh, from Brazil to uh, the Pacific coast. Uh, very few of that has happened, really. Now the Alliance uh, has built a fund that in the future will have the financial must to phase that infrastructure, seriously, and to provide energy from the Alliance uh, in Mexico to the Alliance in Chile, and to uh, connect people, societies, and markets. We also have an innovation group that will allow young uh, members of the Alliance, young people from the countries of the Alliance, to, to put into reality their ideas, their improvements, their, their new ways to see businesses. And that will count also with the financial fund. Um, we have also cooperation in tourism, so as to build one market for uh, the international tourism. And that also has, has a very heavy weight, in, it will have a, a very heavy weight in the, in the global market of tourism. We have also some migratory issues that will work together, like a trust, trust to travel program, um, the elimination of visas among the four countries the possibility of dealing with third countries visas uh, in a coordinated way to last four, for instance, visa in the United States in the future. Uh, that will also allow people to move more freely among our four countries. And one of the best uh, achievements is the MILA, the Integrated Latin American Market. It's already working among Colombia, Chile and Peru. The, the reform that Mexico passed uh, a few months ago will allow Mila to count with Mexico. And so it will become the stock market, the largest stock market, uh, or about the same size of Bolespa in, in Brazil. So in conclusion, our, our, from the Colombian point of view, the Pacific Alliance uh, is no competition with, uh, with anybody. It's an open exercise of like-minded countries that uh, uh, think uh, the same about freedom uh, in the economic field and in politics and democracy. Uh, we don't care much, as we speak, for the evolution of the alliance. For the moment, what counts is to achieve, what, to deliver what we have already agreed on. Okay, that is very important. In the future, we'll see what happens with the alliance. For other uh, aspects and, uh, and, and, um, and commitments. But we see th that the Alliance is the best tool, the best tool for North-South cooperation in the Americas. Yeah. It's going to be very useful for that. It's going to be a very good tool for the cooperation with the Asia-Pacific countries in the future. Uh, and of course, um, in the center of that integration, as I said, is uh, people people that uh, will be free to achieve a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Villegas. And now, Ambassador Sandra Fuentes from Mexico.
thank you very much. Thank you very much to the Instituto Cervantes for, for hosting us uh, here today. Um, I think that I am used to speaking English in the Cervantes, and I don't want to disappoint you, but um, the new generations uh, only speak English. <laughs> they understand their parents that speak uh, sometimes Spanish or even Nahuatl, Mixteco, Zapoteca in the case of my community, but they always answer back in English. So. Um, don't delude yourself. I think that we are going to be speaking English in the foreseeable future. It is an honor to be here today on behalf of uh, Ambassador Medina Mora, who is my dear friend and colleague in uh, Washington, who uh, is not here today because uh, Secretary of State Kerry was in Mexico until uh, yesterday. Uh, and I would um, like to thank uh, his colleagues uh, and uh, try to speak a little bit about what is happening in Mexico and how Mexico sees the Pacific Alliance. Uh, Ambassador Villegas uh, touched upon the reforms uh, that uh, are in motion in, uh, in Mexico. Uh, these are far-reaching uh, structural reforms that will transform my country's uh, strategic sectors such as uh, telecom, energy, uh, other reforms in uh, education, tax, financial services, uh, and economic uh, competition. These uh, sets uh, of reforms are the most ambitious that Mexico has ever taken in the last uh, 30 years. And although we have uh, already passed uh, constitutional reforms that have uh, been, um, um, there has been a consensus with uh, political parties because in order to have constitutional reforms you need a two-third majority in uh, Congress. We are now uh, battling with the bylaws that will affect many, many laws in Mexico. And of course, uh, the, as everybody says, the devil is in the details and therefore it has proven to be di more difficult and more timely than we anticipated to uh, to do the uh, regulatory bylaws. But um, we are um, confident that uh, uh, these bylaws will be approved uh, by uh, at the latest at uh, the end of the summer. Uh, the main reason being that the president has to deliver his uh, address to the nation on September the 1st. And it would be unusual that he did so without having uh, already the uh, bylaws uh, approved. Uh, this means, of course, that Mexico's economy is open uh, for business and we have made great efforts to get uh, to this uh, point. We will keep working in this uh, direction. Uh, besides our friendly regulatory and legal framework, we have uh, a young, talented and very skillful labor force, as well as 13 free trade agreements that give us preferential access to 45 countries and billions of possible consumers. Of course, the uh, Pacific Alliance is a very good example of, uh, of uh, what the ambassador called like-minded uh, countries. And I think this is important given the, the fact that in the region, um, that is not something that you can uh, apply to many countries. Uh, the fact that we are uh, the free trade is among the, the, the most important uh, objects of the, uh, of the alliance, uh, speaks uh, of, uh, uh, of our desire to create uh, an area of deep economic integration um, that would provide not only for the free movement of goods and uh, services, but also capital, but more than anything, people. Uh, and uh, to make uh, most of our synergies among Pacific uh, Latin American countries and also to serve as a bridge to the Asia Pacific where we all know that uh, the most important trade flows are taking place uh, uh, at present. Uh, the aim of the members of the uh, Pacific Alliance is not merely to liberalize uh, tariffs uh, and reduce uh, transaction costs uh, uh, across the borders in order to facilitate uh, trade, investment, and business transactions in the region. This will generate new opportunities for companies willing to invest in the alliance uh, countries. Uh, I think that uh, it, it, it will be very attractive for companies to have access to a market of over 200, 214 million people 
with an average of GDP per capita of about $14,000 uh, in the most stable and dynamic Latin American economies and be able to source from the most competitive providers in the region. Uh, Mexico uh, on its own is already the second largest destination for U.S. exports. Uh, in fact, the U.S. exports to Mexico more than it exports to Brazil, India, China, and Russia combined. Um, and the Pacific Alliance countries buy more products from the U.S. than the whole of the European Union, the whole 29 countries of Europe buy less than we four buy from United uh, States. In addition, given that three alliance uh, members are also participating in the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations, foreign companies that establish themselves in any of these countries and uh, fulfill rules of origin uh, requirements will also have privileged access to <laughs> nations uh, in the Asia-Pacific. Besides the obvious benefits uh, in uh, trade, the alliance will bring positive effects in education as well as in cultural and environmental issues. Certainly for Mexico, this integration symbolizes the most ambitious and innovative initiative in 20 years. Just to give you an idea of the dimensions of our partnership so far, uh, and the ambassador has already touched on some of our achievements and so has uh, the minister from Chile, the elimination of the visa requirement in the case of Mexico for Colombian and Peruvian nationals traveling to Mexico. And it is amazing how you can now detect uh, clearly the uh, Colombian and Peruvian accents uh, when you are uh, uh, in Mexico. I was there for, for Christmas and uh, there were lots and lots of uh, travelers from your countries in the, in the Riviera Maya. Uh, there have been 444 scholarships for undergraduate and postgraduate students and professors. There has been the coordination and joint efforts in our trade promotion agencies and diplomatic offices. Uh, there are uh, places where we are not represented individually. We are making a, a joint effort to open uh, embassies or uh, trade offices uh, that uh, represent uh, two, three, or uh, even the four countries of the alliance. And uh, we have the signature of the additional protocol to the framework agreement, which will lead to the reduction of 92% of the tariffs once it enters into force. Um, the flexible nature of the alliance uh, process means that the issues currently covered by the topics that the mechanism have approached can evolve, and indeed, new areas could be included if there is consensus among alliance members. I think what uh, Ambassador Villega said is very true. We are leaving the moment to what we have committed, and we'll see where we go from now. I think that uh, it is uh, uh, important uh, to to have projects, uh, but uh, if we can achieve with what we have set our minds into, it would already be uh, quite uh, impressive. Uh, in short, the Alliance countries have taken together uh, if, if we take the, uh, the alliance <coughs> countries together, we, we are the world eighth largest economy. We have an ambitious trade and investment liberalization process in place. What is important also to, to note is our macroeconomic stability uh, that will uh, stand them in good stead for future growth. Uh, we have maintained staunchly pro-business policies and provide different ways to engage, either through observer status or by accepting new members. Uh, it seems pretty clear to me that these facts speak for themselves and that we have a lot to gain from working together. We are redrawing the economic map of the region and I look forward to witness more of the benefits and improvements that this alliance will bring to our economic, but above all, to our social development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Fuentes, and now Ambassador Forsyth. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Ignacio. I truly thank my distinguished colleagues and the audience. <laughs> I absolutely feel at home here at the Instituto Cervantes, and currently right now there is a wonderful exhibit of the great Peruvian artist Fernando Cislo, and I strongly advise you all to take a look. It's precisely 
being shown here at the Cultural Center of Instituto Cervantes. <coughs> Great things have been already said by my distinguished colleagues. For instance, my <coughs> Colombian colleague said that, and I think he's right when he said that the Pacific Alliance is no competition to anybody. The only problem with myself is that I love to compete. <laughs> but, but I think he's right. We are not here to compete with any other organization, to compete with any other ideology. The Pacific Alliance is not a political movement. It's a tremendous effort of integration which has so far been extremely successful. And uh, another great thing has been said by my Mexican colleague, uh, when she says that in the near future, we are going to share consulates, we are going to share commercial offices and, and perhaps embassies. The only problem is that several of us might lose our job if that happens. <laughs> but, but I think it's a trend, it's a tremendously trendy issue, uh, which, which will probably change the way we act as diplomats and we create and develop our diplomacy and our, and our commercial strategy uh, toward the, the, the world. Uh, the, it has been, we agreed that I was going to, to share with you a few things about why is this tremendous success of the alliance in the world? Why is it that we have, talked to, that we have taken the world by assault, as, as some people say, uh, with so many uh, institutions and so many countries being uh, tremendously interested in what the, uh, the, uh, the Pacific Alliance means. I will mention to you <coughs> just which are the 30 observer states, which are uh, an active part of our institution. These countries are Costa Rica, is a serious candidate to join the, the Pacific Alliance very soon. Panama is a very interesting candidate too. Canada, Uruguay, Australia, New Zealand, Spain, Guatemala, Japan, Paraguay, Portugal, Honduras, El Salvador, France, Ecuador, the Dominican Republic, the People's Republic of China, the Republic of Korea, Turkey, the United States of America, the Federal Republic of Germany, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, Italy, and the Netherlands, India, Finland, Morocco, Israel, and Singapore. This is a valuable set that benefits the process. And uh, I still, and I, I'll be completely honest with you, I don't really understand the, the reason of this tremendous success. One of the reasons might be that if we act together, if we were a country, uh, our four economies might comprise or might, 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 might be the, the eighth economy of the world. So in that case, if we were a country, we will be joining these talks of the so-called group of eight. This is, this is absolutely amazing with the United States, uh, Germany, uh, France, and, uh, and Canada, and, and, and so on. And uh, that might be one of the reasons. Uh, uh, in the case of Latin America, where numbers are also, are also impressive. But uh, at the same time, there, there might be another reason, which is very important. We have been working, perhaps for 50 years in this process of developing the integration in Latin America. And in so many efforts, we have failed. One of the cases is, for instance, the so-called Latin American Association for Integration, ALADI. I wouldn't call it a failure, but the, this institution, which was created in 1960, did not reach the original goals that were, that were established in, in those years. And so many others, even the Andean group, which is based in my capital in Lima, had not, has not been able to reach the original goals when it was created in 1969. So uh, after so many failures, we decided to act differently. Well, the Latin American economic system was also a failure. So uh, which is the, the space that we can find in, in the world to act together? And uh, something, something new was established, uh, uh, practical goals. And, and of course, a clear direction of where is it that we're going. And that is the Pacific Alliance, and that's probably one of the reasons the world is taking a look to our countries. And uh, that, of course, has given all of us a new, a new orientation and a new direction in the production of our foreign policy. We cannot deny that. Of course, the Pacific Alliance is not a political institution, it's not a political organization. But let me speak to you a little about my country. Many people are 
speaking about your so-called Peruvian miracle. And I, as a Peruvian ambassador, feel extremely proud to represent a country which is an important asset for this Pacific Alliance. We have been in this process from the very beginning, and we strongly support it. Regardless of the government, we are here to stay. Our country is a success story because our economy is increasing steadily over the last decade. Peru GDP has an average growth of 6.4% and it has almost quadrupled in the last decade. By 2014, international financial institutions and major think tanks estimate growth between 5% and 5.5, which would be the second highest in the region. Peruvian economic dynamism has been driven mainly by increased private investment, an increase of the domestic demand that generated a significant growth in domestic consumer markets and the expansion of its foreign trade. This possible scenario has been complemented by a stable rate exchange rate, a country risk level below the regional average, and a healthy level of debt. Noteworthy is the fact that Peru holds accumulated international reserves exceeding one third of its GDP. What explains this so called Peruvian miracle are probably uh, these, these uh, simple interlinked factors. One, a strong and thriving democracy, which includes also protection and promotion of human rights. Sound microeconomic policies and a stable, regardless of the government. Friendly investment environment and attractive sectors to invest. And an openness and integration with the world. In addition to this political stability, Peru has maintained international acknowledged macroeconomic soundness. These policies have been incorporated, as I said, as part of our state policy. Yeah. Another key factor has to do with the development of a friendly environment to attract investment, both domestic and foreign. In this regard, the Peruvian legal framework has been a critical component of the investment promotion. The favorable environment described above has been unanimously recognized by several prestigious mm -hmm. agencies. Investment grade and investment confidence ratings from foreign investors have steadily improved, reinforcing the image of Peru as an attractive country for investment. So, with this, with this in mind, we are very glad to, to mean something for the Pacific Alliance and to be an active member of it. Now, our institution, our structure, is not a political one, but nevertheless is a comprehensive economic and trade initiative promoted by our countries in order to, and this is very important, establish a free trade and economic integration process among the member states, meaning free movement of goods, services, capital, and people in order to have a better and competitive protection for the world. For our country, and I'm sure that principle is shared by by the other three members, this includes the concept of social inclusion. Our institution does not oppose, but rather complements other efforts and initiatives of regional integration. That's also very important. We're mm -hmm. still part of the Andean community. We're still part of the Latin American Association for Integration and, and other processes. The Pacific Alliance has a predominantly economic commercial profile promoting the competitiveness of its members to improve their protection to the world with a specific geographic focal point, being the Asia-Pacific. We're, we're talking of a focal point, exactly. And uh, the, my distinguished colleague, the ambassador, mentioned the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And that's true. Twelve mm -hmm. countries of the apex system of the Pacific Basin are very much engaged in this process of negotiating the TPP treaty. When this TPP is ready, hopefully in the next few months, the volume of their trade will surplus in a very important amount that of the European Union as a whole. And uh, we plan to be part of it. Yes, three of these four countries of the Pacific Alliance are engaged in the process, and hopefully in the near future, Colombia will also join this tremendous initiative to which the Pacific Alliance is structurally related. At the same time, 
Y just let me tell you, and that's a very important piece of information for you, that 212 million people uh, are part of this uh, Pacific Alliance if we uh, make a total of our population. And that is 35% of the population of Latin America and the Caribbean as a whole. So ours would be the fifth most populated sub-region in the world. Now, the combined GDP, and I think it has already been said, of uh, the Pacific Alliance member countries represent 36% of the total of Latin America. And that precisely places us as the eighth largest economy in the world. <coughs> Now, according to the World Bank's Doing Business 2013, our alliance countries rank first, third, fourth, and fifth among the 32 nations of Latin America and the Caribbean for the so-called ease of doing business. And finally, during the first three years of existence, the Pacific Alliance has attracted the attention of major players in the global scenario, which is reflected in the high number of observers, which constitutes, of course, a tremendously valuable asset that is creating a great benefit for the process uh, as a whole. So, uh, I think I will stop now, and uh, I will also be very glad to, to take part in this question period. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Forsyth, and the Pacific Alliance is indeed an extraordinary initiative which holds tremendous promise for the populations of the four countries as well as for the region. It truly is the embodiment of the Pan-American dream. It's very exciting. And with that, I open the floor for questions. If you could please identify yourselves and make it a question, not a comment. And we have 15 minutes. Ambassador Fuentes has to leave. We can run over a little bit. Yes, back there. And please stand up. You'll get a microphone. Good evening. Uh, thank you. And congratulations on getting it done. Uh, my name is Manuel Casanova from Integrity Global Advisors. I usually tell my clients that I tell Boston, Hartford, New York, D.C. is similar to what you have done, so congrats. My question is the following. Um, in the business community, uh, we believe that we want to help back. What industries would you like us to focus here in the U.S. to bring them and activate their business within the Pacific Alliance? What specific industries that we can focus that you deem are the ones that you want to start with? Thank you. Jump <coughs> with that question. Um, I think this is a this is an initiative that could deal with any kind of private division. There, there in, in theory, there shouldn't be exclusions because the heart of the political decision of the Pacific Alliance is the role of the private sector, freedom of the private sector. So everybody's welcome. And the environment we are providing is one of the most friendly, business-friendly environments in the world. Having said that, the priorities that the governments have fixed for our agenda for the future show very clearly that there's a big interest in infrastructure, energy, innovation, and technology. And I would put a fifth with the permission of my colleagues that is not very business uh, originated, but will become business originated in the future. That's the exchange in education um, among the four countries. So I would say those four plus education are the preferred <coughs> ones, but nobody's excluded. Next question. Hi, my name is Thomas Ho. I'm an attorney at Bingham McCutcheon. My question is concerning the relationship between Pacific Alliance members and China. What do you see as your relationship in terms of trade and investment going forward in the next five, ten years with China? Would it change from what it is now? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Well, the, the People's Republic of China is not part of the so-called Trans-Pacific Partnership process. 
but they are very much interested in the developments of the Pacific Alliance, and they are an, an active observer of, of our institution. Now, in the case of our four countries, the trade between China and, and ourselves is tremendously uh, impressive. In, in the particular case of Peru, it ranks among the, the first or the second, it varies, month to month, uh, the most important commercial partner. Or, uh, sometimes the United States is better, sometimes China is better. So, uh, and we have also, I think all our four countries have free trade agreements with, the, with China. Uh, in the case of Mexico, their trade with China is also uh, amazing, <coughs> uh, as it is also uh, with, with Colombia and, and with Chile, of course. The Chileans were, were the first to begin that tremendous uh, effort with, with that view in mind. So, but not only trade, also investment. Uh, and the, the investment of the Chinese uh, enterprises, and, and not only that, banks, for instance, is, is, is also very big in our countries. And uh, we, we are very much following that closely, and we think that the Pacific Alliance has a bigger future, uh, especially related to improving and expanding the horizon of the relations with the, with the Chinese. Maybe I will just um, add something. In the case of Mexico, of course, uh, uh, the question is a little bit different because China is uh, a competitor with uh, Mexico, especially in the U.S. market. Uh, sometimes we share the, uh, the second place, sometimes uh, we fight uh, for it. Uh, China comes uh, in first, uh, we, can, we come in uh, second, and um, we are basically uh, countries that... Uh, uh, export basically manufacturers and uh, uh, this is something that is uh, to be taken into consideration for us of course uh, China is, uh, is an enormous market uh, and there is a lot of Chinese investment uh, in uh, into Mexico but uh, I think our situation is uh, different uh, from uh, other countries in the region especially at the southern tip of the continent uh, where uh, there are um, China is a very good client for commodities and for raw materials, which is uh, not the case of Mexico. Yes, good evening. Um, my name is Ivan Rodero with Caranova Factors. Uh, my question is for Ambassador Villegas. Um, I was hoping you could update us on um, the status of negotiations on TPP for Colombia. I know there have been some obstacles, and uh, I'd like to know what position on Colombia is on TPP. And if I also may ask, um, if you could share with us the structure of the Business Council of uh, the Pacific Alliance and what are the milestones the uh, Council has achieved. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you for your permanent interest in this international topics of, of Colombia. And you give us a great support. Uh, the history of Colombia with TPP is a sad one. Um, we used to be founders of TPP without the United States. When the U.S. came in, they said, Hey, Colombia, you can't be here because you don't have a free trade agreement with us. So we went out. Then we had a free trade agreement with, with the United States. And uh, an argument showed up saying, You're not a member of APEC. We said, Listen, this is a discussion between India and China for a frontier of 2,000 kilometers that we don't control. So our membership of APEC is not in our hands. Anyway, that is, that's still not. So what uh, our government has decided is that, yes, we are interested to be invited to the <coughs> people. We won't knock the door again. Uh, when everybody else is ready, we will be there. Um, we think that the TPP uh, has a hard year because this is an electoral year in the United States. So we'll, we'll see what happens if TPA shows up, if the final negotiation with Japan is closed, if uh, there is a Congress that will be willing to pass that legislation, and so on. So we will we will follow in that very closely. But of course, when everybody's ready, we will be ready too. The Business Council of the Alliance is another novelty. 
it, uh, it, it goes at the same pace and the institutional presence of government. It meets at the same time with the ministers, with the presidents, at the levels required. And it gives permanently advice and requests to the governments of what decisions which should be taken to make that environment even more friendly for business. It works very well. In the case of Colombia, very prominent members of the business community are there. I know it is the case of the rest of, of, of the countries. And uh, it's, a, it's a very positive novelty because it's there where you can really find uh, the, the points of growth and progression for the Pacific Alliance in questions of economic terms. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Maria Emma Mejia, Colombian Ambassador to the United Nations. Thank you very much for hosting us here tonight and for this that can be um, a very important dialogue. We were now discussing almost closing uh, the, something called SDGs, Sustainable Developing Goals, which will set the agenda of all our nations, the 193 nations for um, sustainable developing goals after the Millennium Goals are finished and are, 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 are uh, finished with the declaration of the 2000, um, uh, the year 2000, where we set a pace to 2015 with a Millennium Developing Goals. What do we do afterwards? We're talking about sustainability and we want a road map uh, to where the world will take us uh, in sustainable north-south, south-south and triangular cooperation um, in the year 2030. I, I wonder if you could elaborate a bit on... on I know you, you Ambassador Villera said, uh, let's think of the present, but what would it be of this alliance in 2030 if, if you were to have like a long view of yourselves? I mean, are the observers coming in, uh, increasing trade, or where does an alliance that like the European Union was uh, born out of the alliance of the steel and, and, and carbon and coal, uh, coal uh, where do you view yourselves in, 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 in a longer term, two decades or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think in, in our opinion is uh, 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 the same as uh, Master Villegas that uh, we need to go step by step. Uh, we need a long road to go. There are many, many areas that we can uh, uh, tackle together. But I think uh, in our case, it's, it's, it's very important the consolidation <coughs> of what we are doing right now. Uh, we have many, many areas, of course, that we can tackle. But I think the four pillars are uh, uh, giving a big orientation to our work on what are the main priorities. I think we can integrate uh, other groups uh, as well, uh, according to the different issues or different uh, themes. But uh, in, in my opinion, it's very important to go little by little, but by, by, by thinking mainly in the consolidation of what we are doing uh, without going to some other areas that perhaps are going to take a big energy of what we, we are doing. So uh, this is a grad very gradual uh, uh, approach uh, and we hope that in, in 10 years time we'll be a very consolidated group but for, for that we need to uh, consolidate the four pillars first. We have two microphones and time for two more questions, so we're going to take them to get, uh, together, and then uh, we'll wrap this up. So, first and then second. Hi, I'm Arturo Borsikansky on the Faculty of American University in Washington. My question is, to your knowledge, what are the most difficult obstacles to overcome in the integration of your four countries, and what do you hear are the most difficult obstacles in terms of the TPP negotiations? 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Sergio Serrato. I'm with the uh, Rockefeller Family Group. And there is nothing new, the uh, potential of la our Latin American countries in terms of uh, natural resources and uh, how we are a high working class, and the, the U.S. is a perfect ex example of that. Now, um, when we compare Latin American countries with countries with much more experience in, in business like the U.S. and some European countries, like Germany, England, uh, there is a big lack of uh, two fields in, in Latin America, which is education and infrastructure. How is this alliance going to focus into these two fields? Thank you. Yes, uh, I just wanted to add something very briefly to what uh, Ambassador Mejia said. I think that in 30 more years, you said, well, hopefully, hopefully some of us will be around to take to take a look. But uh, uh, I think that uh, the eradication of poverty in our countries is the the most important goal, and that also means education. And uh, I think the, the, the Ambassador Villegas has mentioned the tremendous importance of, uh, the importance of that, and my Chilean colleague also. And let me just mention that there is a, it should be mentioned here, a new initiative by the United States, by President Obama himself, which is the so-called mm -hmm. 100,000 strong in the Americas. And uh, that very much relates to the goals of the Pacific Alliance, because that means that what he wants is to send to, to bring to the United States a hand, to the United States a hundred thousand students and professors and researchers from our countries here, and at the same time sending to our universities a hundred thousand students, researchers, and professors from the United States year by year. So uh, I think the Pacific Alliance with our great universities in Chile, in Peru, in Argentina, in Colombia have a tremendous uh, say in that process. And uh, that will also help us in order to reach this, this goal. And just very briefly to say, the most difficult obstacles of the Pacific Alliance, I wouldn't call them obstacles. They are probably problems which are part of the, of the challenge that, that, that we face. Perhaps we have a situation. We have democracies which, which confront difficulties. We have a lot of problems in our countries. For instance, drug trafficking, crime, and so many other things, our governments have to deal with with opposition, which is part of the legal system too. So uh, sometimes people in, in our own countries don't really understand what the Pacific, the Pacific Alliance means. So instead of calling it obstacle, I would call them challenges. And we're here. And perhaps I will only add, if I may, um, in my opinion, the main um, challenge to this integration is geography. When you think of the European Union, of course, uh, the border, uh, the borders are so much uh, closer uh, from uh, Portugal to Poland or wherever. Uh, you could easily uh, drive through in uh, perhaps three or four days. If you want to drive from the northest uh, point of uh, Mexico to the southest point of Chile, First of all, it'd be very difficult to do it because there is not the infrastructure to do it, but then it will take weeks. Uh, so I think that geography certainly plays uh, a role in uh, economic integration. But again, uh, if you had asked me about uh, the possibilities of the Pacific Alliance just a few years ago, I don't think that I would have thought that it was possible. And it is possible. I think that our leaders are very pragmatic. Uh, tired of the famous uh, cumbritis because there are summits of everything. They sometimes have summits by uh, video conference uh, and they still keep uh, in touch with each other. I think this is uh, something that we have to recognize. This is a new exercise and up to now the outcome is uh, very um, impressive and what we have achieved in these three years is something that we wouldn't have uh, dreamed about, about uh, uh, before. <coughs> Yes, I'll, uh, very briefly, three comments on this. Uh, the first is that, as uh, Vassar Fuerte said, we broke with a very long history in Latin America on how to deal with integration. Uh, I have to, to, to see with the, with the sentence, I love integration, but without me. 
<laughs> and that was applicable to countries and to private sectors, subsectors. <clears throat> the private sector said, yeah, I love, I love integration, but not with me, not with sugar, not with avocados, not with, <coughs> not, not, let's not mention that, that list. But we broke with that. Integration is for everybody in the private sector and for the, the public policies of the country. Second, the challenge, uh, Maria Emma, I think for the future, and you know this better than me, you have been foreign minister, is the success of the early coordination of foreign policy. We, so far, we have been very successful. In, in very difficult uh, items, we have taken collective decisions that have, uh, have, have had a great success. And then, for the future, I insist, if this is an alliance for the people, the key is going to be how do we make young members of the, our societies to fall in love with the alliance, to feel that their future is better because the alliance exists. And that's a question not only of selling the idea, but of bringing them results they can touch. I, I would say that the most important challenges for the Pacific Alliance are in the area of physical integration, energy integration, logistic, uh, value chain association, and something that is uh, very important for me, that I, I worked in, in China and in Singapore a few years ago, is to develop a common strategy to engage with the Asia-Pacific uh, Basin. So far we have seen very good efforts, but uh, very uh, limited, something that we need to start working uh, very soon in order to, to get, uh, to, to be the bridge that we want to, to be uh, between our region and the enormous potential that the uh, Asia Pacific region is, is giving in, giving to us, we, we I think we need to work uh, very actively in, in defining and developing uh, that uh, common uh, strategy. And with that, mm -hmm. I draw this program mm -hmm. to a close. Thank you to the Instituto Cervantes for hosting it, and to ambassadors. Forsyth, Fuentes, Villegas, and Minister Hurtado, and there is a glass of, I'm sure, Spanish wine waiting for you in the gallery, and I think we have to have another program next year, and we can talk about more challenges, we can talk about energy and sales of energy from Peru to Chile, we can talk about small and medium-sized businesses in the region, we can talk about Brazil, I'm sure we can have a lot of other things to talk about about the Alianza del Pacifico. So thank you all very much for coming out on this rainy night. Thank you.